All right, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1, if you would. John chapter 1, and we're going to be reading verses 35 down through verse 42. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. I do want to let you know that we've got uh, uh, several of our folks, uh, our, some of our, our youth uh, are going down to play uh, at the uh, uh, festivities down on Market Street. In fact, they are headed there now uh, to set up their equipment and play uh, uh, some music uh, down there uh, for the town. I, I don't know what exactly time they're playing. What time are they playing, Cliff? 1230. So they're getting set up and, and so they'll be doing that. We want to be praying for them that uh, God would use them very powerfully uh, as they play down there today. Let's uh, turn to John chapter 1 beginning in verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard uh, John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his uh, own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. This morning, I want to talk to you about a very, very simple subject, the subject of inviting other people to come and see Jesus. Uh, this passage uh, is important uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, this passage contains the first spoken words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And it, the very first words that we hear Jesus say in this Gospel uh, is he asked the two disciples, Andrew and John, what do you seek? In other words, he's looking at them and saying, what have you come looking for? What is it that you desire to learn? Uh, uh, one commentator said it this way. He said, this first word spoken by Jesus is a master question. It builds, bids them to look searchingly at their inmost longings and desires. A hidden promise lies in the question, what are you seeking? Jesus has the highest treasure any man can see. He longs to direct our seeking towards that treasure in order that he may bestow it for our everlasting enrichment. I like that statement. He reminds us when Jesus asks, what are you seeking? He's asking a question that really penetrates to the deep part of our hearts. Everyone in this world is looking for something. The question is, is what you're looking for of great value? And here he asks his disciples, what is it that you are seeking? Not only that, this passage is important because it records the call of Jesus uh, to his the first disciples to salvation. This is highly significant. Uh, over, uh, over in John chapter 20, verse 31, John tells us that the, the primary purpose of this gospel is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that you may have life in his name. So in other words, right off the bat, at the end of the book, John says, listen, I've written this gospel so that you will believe. And right here at the beginning of the gospel, he shows us the first of Jesus' two disciples coming to faith in Christ. And then thirdly, this passage is important because it shows us the primary way that the gospel is going to be transmitted. It is transmitted from one person to another. We love all of the technological advances we have today. Boy, we have social media, and we have internet, and we have, um, you know, uh, t cable television that people can watch our services on. We have all kinds of ways to contact people, and those are all wonderful things. They never can take the place of one person telling another person about Jesus. The gospel spreads on relationships. That's as simple as I can make it. That's the way the gospel is designed to move from person to person to person to person. Um, if you think about that, if you go through the gospel, it's particular here uh, in John, you see that when people encounter Jesus, they immediately wanted to go and tell other people. Think about it. The Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. 
she has this incredible encounter uh, with Jesus. And listen to what the Bible says. The woman then left her pots, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I'd ever done. Now, by the way, she'd been rather immoral prior to this, and all of a sudden, uh, she's encountered salvation, and she goes back to the city, and she begins to tell everybody in the city, listen, there's a guy out there who told me everything that I've done. She points her friends, she points people she knew to Jesus. Uh, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus cast a demon out of a demoniac. Uh, we just call him the demoniac of Gadara. Uh, he's just a man that's living there in the tombs, and Jesus cast out this demon. And listen to what Jesus told him at the end of that account. He said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. In other words, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back home, and I want you to tell people what Jesus has done for you. Now, if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you probably remember when you first became a believer, do you remember how exciting it was? Do you remember how easy it was to go tell people about Christ? I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to tell everybody about it. I remember going to school the day after I got saved, and, and man, I was telling all my friends. They thought, man, what in the world happened to this guy? You know what I'm saying? Uh, he was just this guy uh, on Friday, and suddenly he's a different person. Well, that's something we should maintain and continue to do throughout our Christian walk. Uh, statistics tell us today, listen to this, that 86% of people who come to Christ say they came because they, someone they knew invited them. Stop and think about that for a minute. 86% of people who get saved do so because someone they knew told them. Not that they were surfing the internet and found First Baptist Church on Facebook. That's cool. Don't get me wrong. That's a wonderful tool. But only 14% of people ever come to know Christ by any other means than one person telling another. 86% of people come to know Christ because someone they told him. So this morning, I want to talk about this simple idea of how do we invite others to know Christ. The truth of the matter is that once we know who Jesus is and what he came to do, we can invite others to come to know him and become part of his church. Now, let's just unpack this for a moment. First of all, let's look for a, a couple moments at John the Baptist. Look at verses 35 through 37 here for a moment. The next day, again, was John standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples who heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. John the Baptist, of course, you probably know this, was the forerunner of Jesus. They were actually cousins. Uh, and John the Baptist has one specific thing that he's going to do in his ministry. His entire job is simply point people to Jesus. Announce that the Messiah is coming. And John the Baptist, by the way, did an incredible job of that. All throughout uh, his ministry, John's not there to, to call attention to himself. In fact, the call of these early disciples is one of the great examples of that. Think about it. John had been out there preaching, teaching, announcing the arrival of the Messiah. He's got a group of disciples. And one of the greatest testimonies I think you can have about John the Baptist is once Jesus comes on the scene, he begins to take the people who are following him and point them to follow Jesus. He knows. In fact, he describes it this way. He says, I must decrease and he must increase. In other words, you guys don't need to be following me anymore. You need to be chasing after and following Jesus. He makes that very clear earlier in this chapter. He announces them. He says, I am not the Christ. He wants them to know, listen, guys, there is someone far greater than me who is coming. In fact, he says in verse 27, he said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. John's ministry was all about pointing to Jesus. I want you to notice there, the way he introduces Jesus. He introduces him as by saying, behold the Lamb of God. If you go back to verse um, uh, 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 29, you see the end of that. He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. John is directing his attentions to his disciples uh, by pointing out Jesus, but he's also talking about the ministry that Jesus is going to have. He describes him here as the Lamb 
of God. Now, that Lamb of God is a very rich symbol all through the Old Testament. Uh, you, you remember, for instance, that, that uh, uh, when God uh, told Abraham to offer his son Isaac back in the book of Genesis, do you remember? God had said, I want you to take your only son Isaac, I want you to lay him on the altar, I want you to offer him to me. And, and Abraham does exactly what God had told him to do, but when he pulls up the knife to, to slay his own son, God restricts him and stops him. He says, now I know that you truly love me. Uh, now I know that you're truly devoted to me. And you remember what happens? There's a lamb that takes Isaac's place. That's a picture of our salvation. We are, uh, uh, deserve God's wrath. We deserve his judgment. But instead, God offers his son, his, the lamb of God, in our place. And so John is pulling back this Old Testament idea. And that's the same uh, uh, idea, by the way, that comes through the book of Exodus, where uh, um, uh, God would provide a lamb to take the place of the firstborn in the house of the Israelites. That's where the Passover comes in. Every year, the nation of Israel would gather on the Passover, and they would celebrate this incredible picture of God's redemption through the offering of a lamb. All of that is pointing us to Jesus. And I want you to notice something. Jesus, John says, behold, the Lamb of God. You remember this. The words in your Bible are important. Every word is inspired. That word the is very important. We just skip right over it. But the is important. He doesn't say, behold, a Lamb of God, one of many. He says, the Lamb of God. He is pointing us to the fact that Jesus is the only solution to our problem. He is the only Lamb of God. Only Jesus could bear the penalty of our sin so that we could go free. There's not multiple ways to salvation. You got to understand this. Why is it so urgent we go tell people about Jesus? Because he's the only way of salvation. There's no other way. There's no other way. We, we can look at all of the other world religions in the world today. Every single one of them have one thing at their root. They tell you, fix your own problem. Earn your way back to God. Only Christianity says, you can't do it. God's done it for you through his son, Jesus. It, it, there is no salvation apart from from Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means people who have not heard the gospel are going to die and spend eternity separated from God. You say, preacher, that's not a very popular thing to say. You've known me for 10 years. I'm not that interested in popularity. I want to tell you the truth. There is no salvation apart from Jesus, so we must tell him. He alone can save a man's soul. He alone can reconcile sinners to a holy God. He alone can grant eternal life. He alone can transform lives. It's the most important message in the world. That's why John the Baptist is so passionate. That's why he is willing to give away all of his ministry. That's, that's why he's willing to take all of the years that he had worked and gathered up his disciples. He's willing to give them all away because he knows this. His job is just to point people to Christ. That's his job. That's his job. That's our job, to point people to Jesus. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus gives an invitation in this verse. Uh, when the disciples come and, and they go and they inquire um, of Jesus, looking there in verse 28, Jesus turned and he saw them following, and he said to them, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and you will see. I love that. Um, there's three things I want you to notice there about verse 39. Number one, Jesus invites them to come and see. The emphasis here is not so much on coming to see where he lives. In other words, he's not coming and saying, man, look, dude, I have got a righteous pad I got a new stereo system. I got a new, uh, you know, game bo uh, system over my head. You guys got to come and check out my cool pet. That's not what he's saying. He's not inviting them just to come and see the physical place where he dwells, but he's inviting them into a relationship with him. When he says, come and see, what he's saying is, come and see who I am. 
Come and see what I can do. Come and see what I've got to offer you. He's inviting them to come into a relationship with him. Essentially, Jesus is inviting them to become his followers. Come and see. Come and follow me. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. That's one of the greatest invitations we can just say to people. Every once in a while, I have some, I remember years and years ago, I had a lady that showed up in our church back in West Virginia, and she came in one, one Sunday night and said to me, I'm going to be honest with you, preacher, I don't believe anything that you're telling me. I don't believe there is a God. I don't believe anything that you're telling me about Jesus. I think the whole thing is fake. And then she made this comment. She said, you know what? She said, the Bible is just filled with mistakes. It's filled with contradictions. And I asked her this simple question, have you ever read it? She said, no. I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. Why don't you go home and read the gospel of Mark and come back next week and let's talk about the gospel. Let's just, you, you want to talk about Jesus and why you don't believe him, but you don't even know, you don't even know who he is. You don't even know what he claimed to be. You don't know anything about, go home, read the gospel of Mark, come back next Sunday and we'll talk about him. So she did. She went home. She read the gospel. I got to give her credit. She sat down, read all 16 chapters of the gospel of Mark, came back the next week, and I said, well, what did you find out? She says, well, I wanted to tell you something. This guy's amazing. This is what she said. She said, if he's real and if he's true, if he's real and if he's true, he might be the answer I'm looking for. She said, what do I do next? I said, go home and read the gospel of John. I didn't know what to tell her. I just be very honest with you. I didn't know. I said, go on and read the Gospel of John. She come back the next week. She says, I want to tell you something. This guy is the Son of God. This guy is the Messiah. You know what happened? When she found out who he was and she was exposed to him, listen, Jesus has that effect. I'm not saying he does that in everybody's life. I'm not saying that everybody who reads the Gospels comes to know Christ. We know that that's not true, but I'm going to say this. When they are people who God is calling to salvation are exposed to the truth, he draws them to himself. And just simply come and see. And the third, second thing I want to tell you about it, this is eyewitness testimony. John is telling us, John the writer of this gospel is telling us about his salvation experience. He's telling us about what happened in his life later on. He wrote uh, 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 a couple more letters. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, he says this. The same John who wrote this gospel wrote these words. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and it we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was from the Father and was manifested that that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Did you hear how many times he says, what we saw and what we heard, that's what I'm telling you now. Do you hear many times, John just repeatedly says, listen, guys, I'm not making this up. I'm not telling you something I heard secondhand. I'm not telling you something that, 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 you know, I heard once in a story. I'm telling you what I heard and what I saw. Did you know that you have a, a testimony? If you're a believer, you have seen and you have heard. You have an experience with Christ. In the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation says we overcome Satan by the, our testimony, by the word of our testimony. Why does that happen? Well, because your testimony is your story. You have a story. I have a story. I remember when I was a kid, I'd grow up, and I would hear these guys. I never grow up. We went to this uh, revival one time, and this guy stood up, and I was probably about uh, 10 or 11, maybe maybe a little older than that, and uh, still really, really, really influential, you know, so this guy, or influ- you know, whatever it means when you can be easily influenced, all right? And, uh, and this guy stood up, and, and he gave this incredible testimony. This guy had been, you know, in the Hell's Angels. He had been shot. He had been stabbed. He, he had... He had just lived this life. I remember at one point he opened up his leather jacket to show us his scars. And we, you know, when you're 11 years old and a dude shows you his scars from getting stabbed and shot, he instantly becomes cool. And we all thought, man, I got to have a testimony like that. Dude, I got to get into Hell's Angels so I can have a testimony to tell people. About. Can, can I tell you this? You don't need that man's testimony. All you need is your testimony. All you need is your testimony. My testimony is kind of boring. 
Uh, I got saved when I was 10 years old. Been in church pretty much all my life except for a short period in college when I got backslidden and met Grace. <laughs> all right, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, and, uh, but anyways, just that's kind of my life. It's not a really amazing story. And yet, my story can be used by God in a powerful way. John has a story. He says, listen, this is what we've seen and what we've heard. Just tell people about what you've experienced. The third thing I want you to know is that this was an absolutely life-changing experience for these guys. Um, John t- tells us what time it was. This is, what it, this is how important it was to John. John says it was about the 10th hour. John is writing this gospel years after the fact. Decades, perhaps, after his salvation experience. And yet John says, it was so amazing, I can remember the time. I can remember the time. I mean, can you think about it? Think, think about it. If you're married here, can you remember? I so said, I'm going to have to make up for the comment I just made. So let me tell you another comment. Uh, let me tell you a better story, all right? I can remember the first time I met my wife, Grace. We were freshmen at the little community college in Steubenville, Ohio. I was sitting by my buddy, Joe Calabella, and we were in our principles of management class. And uh, we, were, we were brand new. It was the first week of school that year, and we were sitting there. We didn't know what college was all about. I, I never even dreamed I would go to college, and here I am in college. I, I didn't know what to do. And I remember sitting there, and all I was really interested in was, was looking at the girls coming in. And, and then Grace came in and sat down, and I thought, I'm going to find out who she is. And I never forget, her, the teacher's name was Mary Beth Rutham. And Mrs. Rutham called out the role that day, and when she got to Grace's name, Grace's maiden name was Grace Cora. And honest, the teacher wasn't sure. In fact, never figured it out the entire semester whether Grace's first name was Grace or whether it was Cora. Some days it was Cora Grace, some days it was Grace Cora. And if you're a dude trying to listen carefully to roll to find out her name, that's even more difficult. So that's, that's part A of the story. Wasn't sure exactly what her name was but I knew I wanted to find out. Um, started looking around and did get that figured out by the end of the week. I figured out, you know, the order of her name. But I didn't have her phone number. I didn't really have, and I didn't have any game. Can you guys believe that? I had no game, all right, in, in, in college. I was, I was totally awkward, um, just weird. And, uh, but I did find out she worked at Sears, And I thought, man, I'm going to slide in there on Friday night. Slide in, saunter through Sears and Roebuck. Nothing, dudes, look more sexy than a guy walking through Sears and Roebuck. I'm telling you, man, the women just fawn over you when you're doing that. Here's the worst part. She worked in the women's department. (laughs) Try to look casual. Be an 18-year-old dude sauntering through the women's department. Then when you see her and she says, hello, act cool like you've always, you just intend to be, yeah, yeah, how you doing? I'm just just looking around. (laughs) Listen, she still went out with me. All right? Honest, she did. I'm married to her. All right? Bottom line, I can remember everything about that. I can remember about going to the movie night. We drove separate cars. Poo, that's, that's romantic. Followed her back to her house. She didn't invite me. No, I did. I, she did. She's come back to the house. I, I drove by, I followed her back to the house. We sat on her, her mother's couch, and her mother interrogated me for two and a half hours. All right? At the end of the night, you, got, you guys ready for this? I'm going to tell you how you end the date, the first date. Walked her out. She was saying goodbye. I was saying, I'll see you in class. I'm really enjoying our time. And I said, may I give you a kiss? And she said, yeah. And, buddy, I laid one on her that she still drinks me about. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Why do I tell you that story? 
partly to be funny, but I remember every detail of that encounter. And that was an incredible story, and that was an incredible moment in my life. But I'm going to tell you something. I can also tell you about the moment I met Jesus. I can remember that November night. I can remember the pastor, Bob Humphreys, who had been the first pastor at our little church there in Ohio. He was back preaching a revival, and Bob was only about five foot tall, and he was bald. And he wasn't that great of a preacher. But he preached about John 3, 16, and he said that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. God had been dealing with my heart for a number of weeks. Our Sunday school teacher had been going through that same passage over and over again with us, and she was telling us about the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And and she had been explaining the gospel to us. And, And that night I can remember sitting in the pew beside my dad, holding on to the pew with white knuckles because I wanted to go forward, but I was too afraid to. And I can remember going back to my house, and I pulled out a track right before we were leaving, I didn't want anybody to know what was going on in my life because I really didn't know how to express it. And I'm I'm really kind of introverted and and, and don't like a lot of people paying attention. And and, and so I was walking out of the church that night and there was some tracks laying there on uh, um, a table. And I remember picking up, Cliff's going to laugh at me, an old Jack Chick track. And I slid it in my pocket. And that night I got on my knees beside my bed and I read that track and I I read the scriptures and God spoke to my heart and that night I gave my life to Christ. I can remember every moment of that. I can relive it. I can feel the emotion. You can too if you've been saved. John years later, knew what time it was. He told everybody. Church tradition says that John was over 90 when he died. And this gospel was written shortly before he died. He wrote this gospel probably 60 years after the events that he's talking about, and he still can remember it vividly. If you've been saved, you have that life kind of account. I love hearing the testimonies. Uh, we've got some of our deacons that, you know, every time we, 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 we nominate deacons and, and they come on to become deacons, you know, we have this fondly called the interrogation, which isn't nearly as bad as it sounds, but they come in, they share their testimony. And I love hearing those testimonies of how God reached out and said, John has his testimony. He has a story. There's a third thing I want you to show. Not only do we see Jesus, we see this life encounter, Jesus' invitation and, and, and John's life-changing encounter, but then we see Andrew do something that's interesting. In fact, every time we're going to see Andrew in the rest of the Gospels, this is what he's doing. The only time Andrew's ever mentioned in the Gospels, he's mentioned on the list of the apostles. You know, there'll be the list that'll say, you know, Peter, James, John, John, and it'll list all the apostles. Andrew's on those lists. But the only other accounts of Andrew are times when he's inviting someone to come to know Jesus. You notice what happens there. The very first thing that Andrew does. Look what it says in verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Look what he says in verse 41. He first found his own brother, Simon. I want you to imagine what happened. Andrew goes and he experiences this life-changing moment with Jesus. And the first thing on his mind is, I've got to go tell my brother i got to go tell this man who I love, this person who I care about more than anybody else in the world. Think about what Andrew was risking by doing that. Andrew's going to go tell somebody that he has met the Messiah. He may be reject, rejected. He may be ridiculed. Aunt Peter uh, you know, could just turn away and walk away from her. Simon at that point could have just turned and walked away. But Andrew knows, I've found the key to eternal life. I've found the one who God has been promising. I have experienced salvation. I've got to go tell someone that I care about, someone that I love. We uh, sometimes believe that the hardest people to reach are our family members, and that can be true. We all have had family members that we've talked to about Christ, and they've ridiculed us. They've rejected us. I have family members that... uh, 
um, laugh at me for a number of reasons, but, but one of them is my faith. But others have come to know Christ as a result. Thank God that my sister and my brother-in-law, when they got saved, came and started telling my dad. He didn't respond because of what they said, but they made the dent. They set up the opportunity then for eventually for a pastor to come and talk to him and eventually come to know Christ. Same with you. If you're like 86% of other Christians in America, someone who you love, someone who you care, came and told you about Jesus. They invited you to come to a Bible study. They invited you to come to church. They simply went out and said, listen, I found someone you need to meet. Come and see. Come and see. Now, the big question that we have to ask ourselves is, have you found something that you can't keep to yourself? That night after I met Grace and we went out, I got home that night, I don't know, Since I'm preaching and I want to influence teenagers, I'm going to say 9.30. It's probably a little bit later than that. But I got home, and the first thing I did, I didn't even go to bed. I talked to my mom and dad, told them I was home. That was cool. They asked me how the date went. I said, really, really good. And I went in, and I called my best friend in the world, who later became the best man in my wedding, and I was the best man in his wedding. And I called him, and I said, Man, I found the one. I took him by the next day. If you think I looked stupid sauntering through the women's department at Sears, you should have seen the next day when I took my best friend to saunter through with me. Hey, it worked on Friday. It might work on Saturday. Walk through and walk. I wanted my friend to introduce her. I wanted him to know what I had found and what I had discovered. Same thing with salvation. I remember when I got saved, that same best man was the first person I told that I'd come to know Jesus. My next door neighbor, growing up with, still telling him about Jesus. I was so excited here a few weeks ago. I got to preach back in my hometown, which is really a weird experience, and I got to go pre- preach, and one of the greatest prayers of my life was the guy that I grew up with, lived across the street from me my entire life, just, Lord, please let him come and hear the gospel, and he came. And I don't know what God will do with it. I think God's still working on him. It starts with a simple invitation People all across our county need to hear Jesus. Just as Jesus invited Simon. I love what what, what Jesus said. Jesus actually gives Simon an, an invitation in this passage. In verse 30 to 42, he says, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. There's two important things about that statement. First of all, Jesus knew who Simon was. Guess what? Jesus knows you. When he says, Simon, he's indicating, I know you. Your name in that age was your character. It symbolized who you were. And and Jesus is saying, Simon, I know you. Jesus didn't just know his name. He knew everything about Simon. Can I give you good news? Jesus knows everything about you. He knows the deepest, darkest recesses of your heart. He knows those things that you did that nobody else ever knew. And here's the good news. He still loves you. He still died for you. He still offers you salvation. And, and, and one other thing there, uh, uh, as, as he comes along, uh, he uh, it still invites him to come into this, uh, this relationship, come to know uh, him, and he knew who Simon would become. So I don't even know who you were, Simon, but I know who you're going to become. Your name shall now be Peter. Peter didn't know it that day. But that little nickname, Peter, means rock. Later on, Jesus was going to come along and say, Peter, he's meeting with his disciples shortly before he dies. And Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? 
And the disciples speak up. Some say you're a prophet. Some say that you're one of the, you know, uh, John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. And he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter got it. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you know, Peter, you're right. But you didn't get that from men. God gave that to you. And here's what he says. Upon this rock, he uses the word Peter. He uses the very name, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's not talking about Peter. He's talking about Peter's confession. And he's reminding Peter, you have an important role in the ministry that I'm going to carry out. You have this incredible role. It's an invitation to Simon. Here at the very beginning, did you know this? God has a purpose. When he saves you, it's not just to get you to heaven. Heaven's a cool perk. But the goal of God in salvation is not to get you to heaven. That's just the destination. The goal is to make you like Jesus. The goal is to make you his son or his daughter, to adopt you in his family so that you will worship and glorify and honor him. God has an amazing purpose in your life. Did you know that God has an amazing purpose for every single friend that you have? He has a a purpose and a plan for all the people that live in Metropolis. But in order for them to know that, we have to tell them. So I want to ask you a question. And this is key. People say, well, how do we see more people saved in our church? I'm going to say this to you. It's real simple. We have to go tell. This week, this weekend, next weekend, we've planned some big events. We want to encourage you, just go out and invite Last weekend, we had a great opportunity. A bunch of us got together, and we went over to a neighborhood in our community, and we just started handing out little flyers and started talking to people. And you you know what you'll find? I'm going to promise you this. We saw this a little bit in Chicago a few weeks ago when we were up there. I'll say this to you, and you may think I'm crazy. People right now are open to hear the gospel. I I don't know what's going on. But there is an openness for people to hear the gospel. We saw that over and over again in Chicago, one of the hardest places in the entire world to preach the gospel, a place where normally all summer long Cliff was preparing our teenagers. Listen, you're going to be rejected. You're probably going to be made fun of. You're probably going to get yelled at. People are going to probably be kind of mean to you. We had them thinking, man, this is going to really be hard. They went in there and found out more people than we ever have seen in Chicago before were open to hear the gospel. Amen? By the way, that's not because we've got exceptionally cute kids. Look at them. Now, they're cute. They're wonderful. They've done a wonderful job, but it's not them. God was opening hearts and minds. We saw that same thing, I think, last weekend. The people we got to talk to, we had a lot of folks that were interested. Yes, Thank you for inviting me. I want to come to that. I want to, and they're not just saying that because I think they want to come and, and see superheroes. I think it's because God's opening hearts. Wouldn't it be a shame? <laughs> Wouldn't it be a shame if God was standing in heaven right now saying, I want to send revival to Metropolis, Illinois, but we simply don't do the job We just simply say, no, we're not going to invite. I earnestly believe God wants to save people. I earnestly believe God wants to do an incredible work. I believe that God has people out there this very afternoon that we need to contact and talk to about the gospel. The question is, will we go? So today our invitation is going to be a little different. Yes, I'm going to have a come forward invitation if you need to talk. But here's the real invitation. Here's the real invitation. Six o'clock tonight. Come by here at the church. We've got some little invitation cards. We're going to send some groups down to Market Street, down to the festivities, the big eclipse festivities. Others we're going to send out in the neighborhoods. Maybe you have somebody that God is burdening you with and saying, I need to personally go and invite my friend so-and-so to come next week. I need to talk to them. You go to see them. We'll, 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 we'll tailor make it for you, but here's the deal. Will you come and will you go? We just simply go and invite people, come and see. Come and see. One hour of your time, that's it. Oh, it's going to be hot. I'm not saying that. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. 
But there's a lot of things that are hot and uncomfortable. Can we all agree with that? People sat all night, Friday night, to watch Patriot Night. Was it hot and uncomfortable? Yes. Matt is helping with the football team. He came back. He smelled so bad, I went to bed. You know, it was like he played again. It's hot. It's uncomfortable. It's different. But we need to go, and we need to tell. So tonight, 6 o'clock, real invitation. Come back. Help out. Tomorrow, down at the Eclipse Day, we're going to have an opportunity. The city is invited us. Come down. Run some children's activities. We need some people who man. We have one person who signed up so far to be work with the children besides Clarissa. Only one other person signed up to be there. We need more people. I don't know how many we need. We need as many as we can get, I would, I would guess. Sign up. Go down and help. You say, oh, what am I doing? I'm just helping with kids. But you're demonstrating the love of Christ. You have an opportunity to invite them. Give towards it. I love the generosity of our church. You know, get a phone call this week. Hey, I, I'm willing. Tell me how much it's going to cost to put a, an ad in the newspaper. Not just bought one, bought two. Amen? That's wonderful. Make a sacrifice. Get involved. I'm going to promise you this. If we, if we invite, God will send. Amen? God will save people. God will do things. But we've got to be obedient. We've got to carry out the task of going and telling people about Jesus. Let's go this weekend. Let's go next weekend. Let's see this back lot packed next week, not just to have fun, but to contact them and impact their lives with the gospel. Amen? Would you stand? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this day. Father, I pray we'd buy into this. This is a simple, biblical approach to events. Just go and invite. Go tell people about Jesus. Invite them to come and see. Lord, I pray that you would motivate our church. I pray today that you would spark a desire in your people. Well, that's where revival begins. It doesn't begin outside the church. It begins inside the church. Spark a desire inside of our hearts to reach our community with the gospel. To reach people that we know, people that we love with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today that you'd burden every single one of us with someone. Lay a name, lay a person, lay a family on our hearts that we need to go and invite and tell Lord, I pray that you'd use this week and next weekend as opportunities to connect with people, opportunities to tell them about what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Father, I pray that your will might be done. I pray that you'd speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.